أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي There is this thing about fever There was a story I read a few years ago and it always stuck with me It was a story about a man who went to the dentist because he was in excruciating pain and when he got to the dentist, the dentist told him that he had an infection. But this man did not have health insurance. And so when he was given two medications, one was a painkiller and one was an antibiotic, he could only choose one of them. And so like many of us, he chose the painkiller. He just didn't want to feel the pain anymore. He wanted to be numb. And so what happened is he took the painkiller so he didn't have to feel that anymore. But what happened to the infection? Well, the infection wasn't being addressed. Because he did not address the infection, it actually spread to his brain, and this gentleman ended up dying of the infection. Now, why did this story stick with me so much? This is a true story. The reason it stuck with me is because it was so symbolic of what happens to us in our lives. When we are in pain, either individually or collectively as a community or globally or as an ummah, we tend to just try to treat the symptoms. We just want the pain to go away, but we don't actually treat the root cause of that disease. See, there's a thing about fever. When you have a fever, and this is something me and my husband have recently been experiencing a lot of, when you have a fever, you can take a lot of fever reducer. You can take Tylenol, you can take ibuprofen. But the fever itself is an indication of another problem. It's one thing to try to numb our pains in life. And it's another thing to actually go and look at why are we sick. And that's what I want to talk about today. As an ummah, we're sick. And the Prophet ﷺ said that the ummah is like one body. And when any single part of that body is in pain or is sick, the entire body breaks out in fever. The fever is an indication that there's a sickness. We are in pain as an ummah. We are in, we are in pain all over the world. We are in pain here. We are in pain individually in our lives. We are in pain collectively. We are in pain politically. But the question we have to ask is why do we have this fever? Why are we in pain? What is the sickness that is causing this pain? Now I've divided the causes of sickness into two kinds. One, the body gets sick and weak when it is deprived of its ultimate needs. That's one of the reasons why the body becomes sick and weak, is when we deprive the body of its most essential needs, it becomes weak and it becomes sick. The second reason why the body becomes weak and sick is when a disease hits. Now I want to address the first reason first, and that is the deprivation. Now just like the body, our hearts become sick when we deprive our hearts of the most essential need that the heart has, and that is the spiritual oxygen. What is our spiritual oxygen that we are collectively being deprived of? That is the remembrance of Allah, dhikr, our salah. We have deprived our hearts of the oxygen that the heart needs to stay alive. If a person isn't praying, it's like a person who isn't breathing. We have deprived ourselves of the remembrance of Allah in our lives and as a result, we have become sick. We have become sick as individuals and we have become sick as an ummah. The remembrance of Allah is the oxygen, the food and the water of the heart. And so because we are depriving ourselves of that, our hearts have become sick collectively. 
Now, the other reason why the heart becomes sick and weak and eventually can die is when diseases hit the heart. Now, what are some of the diseases that we are being plagued with as an ummah, as a community and as individuals? The first sickness I want to talk about is a sickness that the Prophet ﷺ warned us about more than 1400 years ago. In a very, very profound hadith, he says to his companions, there will come a day, your enemies will soon gather one another to attack you. Like people gather one another to eat from their dish, to share from their dish. And they asked, is it going to be because we're weak in number or, or, or small in number? And he says, no, you will not be small in number. In fact, you will be large in number. But you will become like the froth on the ocean. You know, the, just those, those little, the bubbles, the froth, the scum that happens, that builds on top of the waves. It doesn't have any weight. It goes wherever the tide takes it. And he says that the fear will be taken out of the hearts of your enemies and in your hearts will be put some, a disease, something called wahan. And he, they asked him, what is wahan? And he, he defined it as hubbid dunya wa karahiyatul maut. It is the love of dunya. Now the reason why this hadith is literally prophecy is because it describes the weakness that will come to our ummah. And he says the enemies will gather one another to attack you. And these attacks that we're seeing right now, they're all different forms. In some places in the world, they're physical. And in some places, they are spiritual, mental, psychological. Islamophobia is a machine. These are the types of attacks that we are seeing right now. You know, it be, it's become cool. It's become com acceptable. In fact, it has become something that will give you political capital to attack Islam and Muslims. It has become an acceptable social capital type of bigotry. The Prophet ﷺ diagnosed this issue. He said, dunya wa maut. The love of dunya is a disease that's going to make us politically weak. That's what this hadith is saying. It's a disease, but what kind of disease is it? It's a spiritual disease. What is hubbid dunya? The love of this life. What does it mean to love dunya? What does it mean to love dunya? Does it mean that we're not allowed to have nice things? Does it mean we're not allowed to, to have jobs and get married and have nice houses? Of course we can. In fact, there were many companions who were extremely wealthy. But the problem is that the dunya has taken over our hearts. Hubbid dunya becomes a disease when you don't own your stuff, your stuff owns you. You don't own your money, your money owns you. You don't own your status, your status owns you. You don't own your power, your power owns you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, اعلموا أنما الحياة الدنيا لعب ولهو وزينة وتفاخر بينكم وتكاثر في الأموال والأولاد. Know that the life of this world is play, amusement. You know what's very interesting about this ayah? Is when you break down this ayah, when you break down this ayah from Surah Al-Hadid, you find that this ayah is a, is a chronological timeline of our life in this world, of the things that matter most to us in this world. Because when we first come into this life, what's the most important thing to us as a child? It's play. If you want to get a present for a little child and you, spend a, and you drop $1,000 on an Armani suit, they're really not going to care. But if you spend 50 cents on a rattle, they'll be happy. And this is because what matters most when you first come into this dunya is just, I want to play. Laib. I'lamu annam al dunya laibun wa lahwun. And then you get a little bit older and now you're kind of like in, in late elementary, middle school. 
And now, the most important thing to you, anyone who has people in that age, any children in that age group, what's, what's their favorite thing to say? I'm bored. And the reason for that is because at that age, they want to be entertained, constantly stimulated and entertained. And that's because at that point, the most important thing to them is entertainment, amusement. This is called lahu in the Quran. And Allah says, after laib, he says lahu. Laibun wa lahun wa zina. Then you get a little bit older. And what is hubb dunya about when you're in high school? Well, pretty much it's about what you look like, what you're wearing. This is the time when people are so concerned about what they look like that this is when you see spikes in things like eating disorders because what you look like becomes of utmost importance. And so here Allah says zina. Zina is adornment, looking good. Now you get a little bit older. And now it's not so much about your rattles and your video games or even your brand names. Now it's about proving yourself. Now it's about how do I stack up next to someone else? What medical school are you getting into? How are your grades? And now it's tafakhurum baynakum. Now you're trying to show off. You're trying to compete. Then you get established, you get a big house, nice car, and children. And now what is it? وَتَكَاثُرٌ فِي الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَوْلَادِ Now it's about getting a lot or competing in the accumulation with regards to money and your children. But what's so interesting here is that Allah says all of this, all of this, He gives us an analogy. See, all of these are halal things. But these are the things we get caught up in. And each person is at a different stage in that dunya. But all of it, All of this stuff that we get so caught up in, it's like a heavy rain that makes the farmer super excited for a while. Because what happens, it brings vegetation. But then what happens to that vegetation? These things that we chase, what happens to it? It starts to crumble, becomes dry and yellow, and then it just becomes nothing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us that the life of this world isn't meant to be chased. It isn't meant to be loved in that way. And when you take hubb dunya and you fill your heart with it, it actually causes all types of other spiritual diseases. The second disease, which also actually comes out of hubb dunya, is the disease of envy. The disease of envy is destroying our body as an ummah. And now we have social media, right? So that we can really like, really express this disease. And the reason why we have the disease of envy is because we have lost focus of what matters most. And so our competitions and our, our, comp our, our comparisons are all about dunya. What does that person look like? What is that person wearing? What kind of car do they have? What kind of house do they have? And so our comparisons are all dunya, dunya, dunya. We've lost sight of what actually matters. And what is the cure for these diseases? Well, the first disease, disease of hubb dunya The disease of hubb dunya is to refocus on the final home. I mentioned this earlier. Every single one of us are moving. And anyone who's ever moved before knows that in order to move, you have to furnish the home you're moving to. You have to prepare it. Every single person is moving into their grave. And that's without a shadow of a doubt. But the question is, have you furnished that home? Some of us are gonna get to that home and it's gonna have no furniture. Some of us are gonna get to that home and in fact, it's gonna have been burnt down. And so the question becomes not whether or not we're moving, it's how does our home look once we get there? And so the cure to hubb dunya 
is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, attaqu allaha wal tandur nafsum ma qaddamat li ghad. Wa attaqu allah. O you who have believed, have taqwa of Allah, be conscious of Allah, and let everyone know, let everyone be, be aware of what they're putting forth for tomorrow. Plan for that home because you're going there. The question is only how furnished will it be? What condition will that home be in when you arrive? The cure to hubbid dunya is to shift your focus back to the final tomorrow and to have some plan for that. What is the cure for the disease that is plaguing us of envy? This constant social comparison. I never have enough, but, but they have more. There are studies that show that the more people use social media, the more they are dissatisfied with their own lives. Part of the reason for that, of course, is that our social media is our photoshopped version of our lives. And of course, we're comparing my real life with that person's photoshopped life. It, it's fake. It's not real. And so as a result, I become less and less satisfied with my own self, my own figure, my own clothes, my own home, my own spouse, maybe. And that's because of these constant comparisons with something that isn't even real, because there's always a filter. And so the cure to envy is gratitude. Allah tells us that if we are grateful, He will increase us. He will give us more. The cure to your envy is be grateful for what Allah has given you. The next disease that is plaguing us individually as well as collectively is the disease of doubt. Many of us are being plagued with this concept of doubt. Some people are even being pushed to leave the deen because of doubt. But I think we've made a mistake when we, when we characterize or rather when we look at the root of doubt. See, we need knowledge, we need information, but realize that check, doubt is not a disease of the intellect, it is a disease of the heart. See, you can sit and give all this information to a person who has the disease of check in their hearts and it won't make any difference because you're talking to the mind. It is not going to cure the problem until you fix the heart. One of the reasons why we suffer from the disease of shek, of doubt, is because of our sins. It is actually a spiritual disease. And sometimes we are trying to heal that disease in the wrong way by just talking to the mind, but the heart is still sick. And Allah and His Messenger told us, the Prophet ﷺ said, Inna fil jasadi mudra. In the body there is a lump of flesh. Ida salahat salah al jasadu kullu. If it is set right, the entire body is set right. Wa ida fasadat, fasad al jasadu kullu ala wa hi al qalb. And if it's corrupted, the entire body is corrupted. Ala wa hi al qalb. Indeed, it is the heart. See, when the heart is corrupted, that's when you see these diseases. That's when you see things like the diseases of shek, of doubt. If you want to cure that, you have to go and cure the heart. And one of the most powerful cures of the heart is istighfar. See, our hearts become sick by our sins. And one of those sicknesses is doubt. I don't know which way to go. I'm not sure about this. I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure about anything. That is a symptom of our sins. It is a symptom that our hearts have been covered by our sins and have not been cleaned. Just like if we don't clean our bodies, we're going to start to get symptoms of that disease from the dirt. And the, and the cure is to clean the heart through istighfar, through repentance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <coughs> Another disease which has, has, has inflicted 
itself upon us is that individually and collectively, we have lost this concept of good character. There are certain qualities which we have lost. One of them is the quality of honesty. One of them is the quality of mercy for one another, compassion, empathy. We've lost these qualities that, that make a person have that beautiful, beautiful manners that the Prophet ﷺ said, Innama I have been sent to bring about, to perfect good manners. But we've lost these qualities and as a result, we've become diseased as an ummah. What is the cure? We have to go back to unconditional honesty. If you're talking to your children, be honest. Don't think because they're children, it's okay to lie to them. If you're talking to anyone, be honest. Be in the habit of being honest. Because until we go back to these beautiful manners, we will not fix our condition. See, we complain a lot about the type of leadership that we have, don't we? Leadership in our masajid, we say, oh, it's, not, it's corrupt. Leadership in our countries, it's corrupt. Do you know why we have corrupt leadership? Because our leadership is a reflection of us. It's a reflection of what we are inside. If we want the leaders to be better, we have to become better. We have to become honest if we want our leaders to be honest. Because they are a reflection of who we are inside. Changing ourselves. Indeed Allah will not, does not change the condition of a people until they change what's inside themselves. If you want just leaders, be just in your own families. Be just in your organizations, at your schools, in your masajid. We can't even have a proper board in the masjid and we're gonna talk about justice at the, at the state level. We have to start to change ourselves going back to that beautiful character, to stop being harsh, to stop having a hard heart. You know, one of the problems we have is we think that when you become religious, it means you have to be really mean, right? You have to be harsh. Sometimes people, as they become more and more religious, they become more and more harsh with their families. All of a sudden, everything is haram, and, and now they just, they, they've actually become more hardened. That's not what it means to be religious. The Prophet ﷺ was the softest of people. He had the softest of hearts. And he said, khayrukum, khayrukum li ahli. The best of you are the best to their families. It's not that the best of you are the best to those in the masjid or the most polite to the people at the cash register but the best to your families. That's actually the litmus test of your righteousness. How do you treat your family when you get home? That is the litmus test put down by the Prophet ﷺ. We have to go back to good character. I have been sent to beautify, to perfect beautiful manners and character. We have to go back to mercy between one another, compassion, empathy. That none of you truly believe until they love for others what they love for themselves. We have to be a people who care about one another. We cannot have this nefsi nefsi attitude. And if we do, it's a sign that there's a disease internally. Finally, one of the diseases that is plaguing us as a community, both individually as well as collectively, is the disease of despair. I believe that we have fallen into despair. Many of us feel as those who came before us felt. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually asks us rather, do 
Do you believe, do you think that you will enter paradise without going through that which those who came before you went through? Those people who came before us, they were tested, they were given adversity, they were tried, they were so shaken that even the messengers and those with the messengers asked, Mata Nasrullah, when will the help of Allah come? I think that we feel like that right now. And many of us have fallen into despair. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not want us to fall into despair. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us at the end of this ayah, Ala inna Nasrullahi Qareeb. Indeed, the help of Allah is near. Aquli qawli hadha wa astaghfar Allah li wa lakum. Inna wa ghafoon rahim Subhanaka Allah wa bihamdak ashadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruk wa atubu layk. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.